You know, for most of us, it's pretty difficult to think about our life at a different time. It's difficult to think about life without running water. I mean, most of us have never lived at a time or a place where that was a thing, right? We, we've never lived in a, a time where there was no grocery store uh, or, or no vending machine or, or no fast food drive throughs I mean, most of us, that's just been a part of our life forever. And the interesting thing about that perspective is for most of human history, I'm talking about thousands and thousands of years, luxuries like that just simply didn't exist. And, and I, I hear stories from my grandparents about there's a day when I used to walk uphill three miles in the snow barefoot to school. And I used to hear about those days where you would have to fetch water from a stream and bring it to the house. And they would tell stories about how they would have to leave in the middle of the night, go outside just to use the bathroom. And I'm like, man, that's just a different day. But you know, in the grand scheme of things, that was less than 100 years ago. But today, it's different, isn't it? Today, if you're hungry, you eat. If you're thirsty, you drink. All the necessities for life have been made readily available for most of us here today. And I can't help but wonder how that's affected our dependency on the Lord. You know, in biblical days, the people had the same needs that we have. They woke up in the morning hungry. And they, they needed water to drink. But how they went about requesting those things and receiving those things look completely different. Today, I want to invite you to join me as we open God's word to 1 Kings chapter 17. And as we get to 1 Kings chapter 17 today, we're going to see exactly that. We're going to see what it looks like to depend on the, on the Lord and how the Lord provides for his people. But as you're turning to 1 Kings chapter 17, I want to back up and give you a little context so you know what's really happening as you enter this time in Israel. You most likely remember a guy named David, King David. Well, David was the man that God used to unify the tribes of Israel into a kingdom. And God promised that from his line would come a messianic king. One who would one day establish God's kingdom over the nations and fulfill the promises that were made to Abraham like we read in Genesis chapter 12. Well, the book of 1 Kings give us, gives us a long list of future kings that would come after David and none of them lived up to that promise. In fact, when you read about these kings, you're like, man, these guys were really just running Israel into the ground. When David died, his son Solomon took over. But before he died, David told his son, stay faithful to the covenant of God and give allegiance only to the one true God of Israel. That's what he told his son. And Solomon started off really strong with that, by the way. In the very beginning, he asked God to grant him wisdom so that he could lead his people well. And God gave him wisdom. And he even built a temple to the God of Israel where God's presence would be, where God's people would come and worship. All of that was great. But as soon as the temple project was being wrapped up, Solomon started making some crazy decisions and some really bad choices. And as a result, the kingdom that he was working so hard to establish literally fell apart. In fact, when you go back, you look at chapters 9 through 11, you really see Solomon change. In that season, he got super political. And he started marrying the daughters of all these different kings in order to establish political alliances with all of these different nations. I mean, he married hundreds of women. That was his, that was his way of connecting to all, of the, all the, the different nations. But what made matters even worse is then he began adopting their false gods. And he adopted them and started introducing the worship of these false gods and idols to the people of Israel. Now you can just imagine how that made God feel. It didn't set real well with God. It completely went against the covenant and it completely went against what David told Solomon. And so now you're reading these chapters and you're seeing Solomon's heart changing. And as his heart changes, you see his leadership start to change as well. And now as a result, you're just waiting for God to smite him, right? You want, you're like, God's about to hit him with a lightning bolt and take him out. But that doesn't happen. When you keep reading, you see Solomon actually goes on to become the most powerful man in the whole world. He was the wealthiest man, the most powerful man on the entire planet. In fact, he built himself an incredible palace, unlike anything ever built before. 
He goes on to build each of his 700 wives their own homes. He he built massive gardens and he built water reservoirs in the desert. He built a huge army to protect his land. He even instituted slave labor to accommodate his building projects. Now, why is all this important that we understand this today? Well, when you go back to the Torah and you look at God's guidelines for the kings of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 17, what you're going to see is Solomon broke every single one of those guidelines. In fact, at the end of his life, Solomon looked nothing like his father David. I would say he looks more like Pharaoh leading God's people in the wrong direction. And then it continued. When Solomon's son, Rehoboam, took over, he continued in that pattern of poor leadership. I mean, he's overcome with greed. He has a lust for power. In fact, at one point, he increased taxes for slave labor, and the people in the northern tribes under the leadership of a guy named Jeroboam rejected the idea, and that rejection led them to rebel and secede and to form their own rival kingdom. And so now, here's the picture in Israel. You ready? Israel's been split into two kingdoms. You got the southern kingdom called Judah, centered in Jerusalem with kings from the line of David, but now you have this new northern kingdom called Israel, whose capital will go on to be Samaria. Now moving forward, both of these kingdoms would go on to have 20 kings that are written about in this book. And as you read about these men, you see the author of 1 Kings evaluate their leadership and he evaluates their reign as king. And he really, he really evaluated them based off of a simple criteria that I want to share with you right now. You ready? Number one, did they worship the God of Israel alone? This is what he's asking. Did this king worship the God of Israel alone or did they promote the worship of other gods just to appease the people? Secondly, Did they deal with idolatry among the people? This is a big deal. Did they deal with it or did they turn a blind eye to it? And thirdly, did they remain faithful to the covenant like David or did they become corrupt and unjust? And according to this criteria in his evaluation, the author found no good kings in the northern Israel. None. Zero out of 20 made the cut. Only eight out of 20 were considered to be good kings in the southern Judah. Now, no, we haven't talked about one other thing. And that is, while these kings were in power, God had also established prophets among the people. Many times when you hear about a prophet in the Bible, you think they're maybe a crazy person or a mystic or some kind of fortune teller or something. That's not true at all. In fact, when you look at the Bible, you see that prophets were the people that God put on planet Earth to speak on God's behalf. They were like covenant watchdogs that called out idolatry and injustices among the kings and the people. So when you read God's word, especially in this part of the Bible, it was the prophets that would challenge Israel to repent and to follow God. So as you open up to 1 Kings 17 today, I want you to see, we're going to be introduced to one of the most prominent prophets in the northern kingdom. He was a man named Elijah. Now, at the time of Elijah, the northern king was named Ahab, and Ahab's wife was named Jezebel. Now, let me just say off the bat, Elijah never saw eye to eye with Ahab and Jezebel. And I say that for several reasons. The primary reason was because during their reign, They instituted the worship of a false god. Another false god, the Canaanite god, a god that went by the name of Baal. And here's why this is important today. In the Canaanite religion, it was Baal who had authority over the rain. He had authority over the rain. The absence of rain meant that there was an absence of Baal. So now you can imagine, it's the dry season And the people of Israel, God's people, are now bowing down and they're making sacrifices to this false God. And now they're depending on this false God for rain. Listen, that was before tap water, y'all. It's hard for us to understand this. It's before bottled water. You couldn't just drop by the store and get a gallon. This is before the reverse osmosis machine up in your house. There was no water and they were needing water. They were like us. They needed water to live and survive. They needed it for their bodies. They needed it for their crops. They were desperate for it. And now Elijah finds himself 
living among God's people in a polytheistic culture where people had forgotten the source of their provisions. That was the scene as you opened up God's word to 1 Kings 17. So let's begin reading in verse one. It says, now Elijah the Tishbite from the Gilead settlers said to Ahab, remember Ahab is the king, so as the Lord God of Israel lives in whose presence I stand, there will be no dew or rain during these years except by my command. Listen, when Elijah opened his mouth to speak, he was speaking to the king, yes, but he was also communicating to a confused group of people. People that had become dependent on false gods to provide for them. Things that only God could provide. They were looking to dead gods to bring them things that were required for life. And in that moment, Elijah spoke out on God's behalf and he reminded the king and he reminded the people that dead gods won't bring the rain. Dead gods won't bring the rain. And that was true then and it's true now. He said in verse one, there will be no dew or rain during these years except by my command. In other words, you can worship Baal all you want. He's a false god, it's an idol, go for it if you want. He said you can make sacrifices to Baal, you can make promises to Baal, and you can beg him to provide for you, but the rain is not gonna come until I say so. Let me ask you a personal question as we get rolling today. Who are you trusting to bring the rain. Who are you trusting to bring the rain? In your life, in your relationship, in your family, in your profession, who are you trusting to bring the rain? Now I know you're not bowing down to golden idols or statues, but when it comes to the things in your life that you need today, that you're desperate for today, the things that you need to survive, who are you depending on? When it comes to things like health and healing, who are you depending on for that? You know, many times if we're being honest, even for those of us who know the Lord, when we get sick, we get desperate and we start doing what? We rely on doctors and medicines and treatment plans and hospitals and none of those things are bad. But when when going to God is the last thing you do, that's a problem with the Lord. I mean, who do you depend on for, for income or your financial stability? I mean, most of the time, if we're being honest, we tend on our ability to go find a job, our ability to advance our education. We build our resume. We leverage our relationships. We do whatever we can do. And many times we forget that God is the one who provides. God is our provider. How about when it comes to things like finding love? Man, we've got a lot of young people today that are saying, man, all I want to do in this season is fall in love. Well, let me ask you a question. How are you approaching that? Many of us haven't even thought about the Lord, man. We're thinking, if I'm gonna fall in love, it's gonna take a a blind date that works out perfectly, right? Like they literally have to be blind kind of date. (laughs) Or maybe you're depending on that matchmaking friend and you're like, I gotta have the right friend who knows the right people and I gotta get this person to follow me so that we can connect and you got this whole scheme. Listen, maybe, maybe what's going wrong right now is we're not depending on God to find love, you're depending on the experts at farmersonly.com a little bit too much, you know what I'm saying? Listen, it's all about our dependence when it comes to the Lord. Sometimes in a world like this, a world of abundance, a world of blessings and resources, we tend to forget that God designed us to have a primary dependency on him. And God's people have forgotten that truth time and time again. That's why Elijah said to Ahab in verse one, he said, there's a famine coming to this land. He said, it's gonna be a long and severe famine. It's going to wipe everybody out and Israel is gonna be punished for their sins. You know what he was saying? Israel has sinned against God and he was also looking at an evil king saying, you're gonna get what's coming to you as well. Not only was he evil, look at what it says in chapter 16, verse 30. It said, Ahab, son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight more than all who were before him. So this wasn't just a bad dude. This was like the most evil king that's ever been. And and when I'm reading this, I'm seeing Ahab's evil provoked God's anger. And now as a result, Ahab was about to experience God's punishment for that sin. Fruitful land was about to become barren land, all because God's people forgot the source of their blessings and they turned to false gods instead of turning to the one true God. Who are you turning to? 
There's a couple things in this story that I think God wants us to take note of today. But I want you to get that scene in your mind. Here's a season where the government leader was an evil person. This is a season where the culture was sinful and getting worse by the day. This is a culture where people were running away from God, not to God. And I'm talking about people were fleeing God that had been following God beforehand. This was a season where everything was going wrong. There was famine in the land. Inflation was up. Resources were down. People were scrambling to survive. And yet what I want you to see that in that context, God provided for those who were faithful. God provides for those who are faithful. Verse two, the word of the Lord came to him. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide at the Wadi Cherith where it enters the Jordan. I want you to notice how God provided for Elijah and how God provided for those who were faithful in this season. He did that in a couple of different ways. The first thing is God hid them from the danger. We see that in verse three. It said to hide at the Wadi Cherith. By the way, the Wadi Cherith was a place uh, on the east side of the Jordan River that was known for being an inhospitable area that had no food supply. Just imagine a barren desert with absolutely nothing. It didn't even have shade, much less food. Even today, when you cross the Jordan River from Israel to Jordan, you literally leave the promised land that has everything, beautiful, green, and you enter a desert land that has nothing. And that's what God was calling him to do. He told him, I want you to go to the desert because I'm gonna hide you there. Verse four, he said, you are to drink from the wadi. I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he proceeded to do what the Lord commanded. Elijah left and lived at the Wadi Cherith where it enters the Jordan. The ravens kept bringing him bread and meat in the morning and in the evening, and he would drink from the Wadi. Listen, God not only hid him from danger, we see God provided for him along the way. He told him, drink from the Wadi. By the way, when he said the Wadi, he's talking about the water. And he told them, he said, I've already commanded the ravens. They're going to provide for you along the way. They're going to bring meat and bread in the morning and the evening. Can you just stop for a second and imagine what that must have sounded like coming from the mouth of God? Like, what did you just say to me? What did Jesus say? I mean, here's what God just said. I know I'm sending you to a place that doesn't have food, but don't forget, I'm still God. I can do whatever I want to do. So you know what I've done? I've commanded a bunch of birds to drop a buffet on your head twice a day. And this is how it's going to go, right? I mean, I mean, he's explaining it to him, and he's saying, listen, as a result, you're going to eat better in the, in the next couple of days than you've been eating in the past. Because I'm dropping bread and meat on your head for breakfast and for dinner. Man, when I read that, you know what it reminds me of? If God tells you to do something, he will provide for you when you do it. If God tells you to do something and you walk by faith and accomplish that mission, God will provide for you along the way, even when his provisions don't make any sense. And we've said it so many times, God blesses obedience and he equips those that he calls. There have been so many times in my life where I've thought that obeying God and doing what God was leading me to do just didn't make sense and really was impossible. I remember when we first got married, we were broke. Anybody know what it feels like to be a newlywed broke person? Hello, there is, that's a different kind of broke is newlywed broke, amen? We were newlywed broke. And I remember thinking as we're putting our budget together, thinking, you know what, we know God's word. We know that God has commanded us to tithe back, to give a tenth back to our church of the things that he's blessed us with. I'd grown up in church. I'd been saved by God. But if I'm being honest, our first couple of years, you probably couldn't tell that I was saved. In that season, I was, I was the Lord of my own life. I made decisions not based off of what God was telling me to do. I was making decisions based off of what I thought was best for me and, and my house. And here's what I learned in that season. Are you ready for this? You will never experience God's best if you live in disobedience. You will never experience God's very best if you live in disobedience. In that season, I knew God's word, but I robbed God of what was his because I thought we can't afford to obey God right now. That's what I thought. But there was a point in our marriage when God got my attention and I decided to 
test God the way that scripture tells me to test God. And when I did that, it's like God started blessing our obedience and our stewardship in ways that I could have never even imagined in our life. God began blessing us in, in ways that were really hard to explain. And you may be here today and you're in that place right now and you're thinking, man, we can't afford to obey God right now. Wrong. Listen, you can't afford to disobey God right now. Disobedience communicates something to the heart of God that we don't want to communicate. I remember when God was leading me into full-time ministry. That was a tough season for us because it was something I'd been running away from my whole life. I mean, for several years. It's the only thing I've ever told God that I wouldn't do, by the way. This is not something that I wanted to do. In fact, this is the one thing I said, I hope God never makes me do this because I had a way better plan for my life and that's just the way that it works sometimes. But in that season, God opened up a door and I knew he was calling me to take a step of faith and to walk through that door and to begin that ministry journey. And one day as we were preparing in that season, I remember telling Audra, I said, first of all, we can't afford to make this move. And second of all, I can't do this job. I've never done this before. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not prepared for what God's calling me to do. I mean, at that time, we were wrapping up our college career and, and we, were, we were living in a time where I had a really good job and, and we, everything we wanted, we, we had. And, and now God's calling us to walk through this door of ministry. And I knew that it meant a couple things. It meant I was gonna have to take a significant pay cut. I also knew it meant that I would have to move a thousand miles away from my home, a thousand miles away from family members. And I was gonna have to go to a place I had never been. I didn't feel equipped to do the work that God was calling me to. But I learned something in that season over 20 years ago that have stuck with me ever since. And you've heard me say these things over and over again, even today. Number one thing I learned, God blesses obedience. Number two, he equips those that he calls. And number three, he always provides for his people. Always. Listen, when God sent Elijah and those faithful believers across the river to the Wadi Cherith. It didn't matter if it was barren land. It didn't matter if there was no food. It didn't matter if God's instructions and directions didn't make any sense. Let me tell you something. The safest place you can be is in the center of God's will. I'm gonna say it again. The safest place you can be is in the center of God's will. You say, well, how do I get there? Listen, you obey the Lord. The only way you can miss the will of God is to be disobedient to the commands of God. In this passage of scripture, we see Elijah and the people, what do they do? They trusted God enough to follow God. And they followed God even when it didn't make any sense. And as a result, we see God provide for them every step of the way. Let me show you something else that we can take away from this passage of scripture. The second thing is when God's provisions dry up, more provisions come. Look at verse seven. After a while, the wadi dried up because there had been no rain in the land. No rain in the land. Listen, let me tell you this about our God. God is our source. If you believe that, say amen. amen. God is our source for everything and his well never runs dry. But I will say this. He's also a God that uses resources to provide for us. And sometimes those resources do run dry. All the broke people say amen, right? I mean, we've experienced that before. You're like, God, you're our source, you're good, you give us all these things, but you've given me money, and now I have no money. Or I have food, now I have no food. And we know what that feels like when the resources are lacking. In this story, the wadi, or the water, it dried up because of a lack of rain. But here's what I want you to notice. The source, God, allowed this resource, which was the water, to dry up. He allowed that to happen. And he allowed it because he wanted to accomplish a couple of things in this season. I want you to see what those things are. The first one, in this season, he reminded Elijah to depend on him. He reminds him of his dependence on God. When the ravens stop dropping food and the water dries up, you're almost forced to stop and to consider the true source of all your blessings. Have you been there before? That's where Elijah was, a place where he's thinking, okay, God, I've done what you've asked me to do. I've, I've gone where you told me to go, and now I'm thirsty. I'm dying. I don't have anything to eat. I don't have what I need. 
For in his life, this was a moment of reset. It was a, a moment of recalibration, a moment where he's resetting everything and he's, he's having to consider what is the true source of my blessings. See, God wanted to do something in his heart at this season in his story. But the second thing he wanted to accomplish is this. He, he relocated Elijah so that others could experience God's provision. And we see that play out in verse eight and nine. It says, then the word of the Lord came to him. Get up, go to Zarephath that belongs to Sidon and stay there. Look, I have commanded a woman who is a widow to provide for you there. Now, I know when we read that, it sounds like a pretty easy road trip. But in this day, God was sending Elijah on a pretty significant excursion. He was sending him from the east side of the Jordan River all the way to a place called Zarephath in Phoenicia, which was about a 50 to 60 mile journey through the desert. It would have been a tough road trip. As a side note, Zarephath was Baal's hometown. So you can imagine, not only was this the hub for pagan worship filled with people that hated Elijah because they still blamed him for the famine, but the drought in Zarephath was also just as severe as every other place in the region. And yet God told Elijah, that's where I want you to go. I want you to go to that place because I've placed a widow there for the purpose of providing for you. Keep reading, verse 10, it says, so Elijah got up and went to Zarephath. When he arrived at the city gate, there was a widow gathering wood. Elijah called to her and said, please bring me a little water and a cup and let me drink. And she went to get it. He called to her and said, please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, as the Lord your God lives, I don't have anything baked only a handful of flour in the jar and a bit of oil in the jug. Just now I'm gathering a couple of sticks in order to go prepare it for myself and my son so we can eat it and die. That's how bad the famine was. This lady was literally preparing one final meal with what she had left so that they could fill their stomachs one final time and then die because they didn't have what they needed to survive. Verse 13, then Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a small loaf from it and bring it out to me. Afterward, you may make some for yourself and your son, for this is what the Lord God of Israel says. The flour jar will not become empty and the oil jug will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the surface of the land. So she proceeded to do according to the word of Elijah. Then the woman, Elijah, and her household ate for many days. The flour jar did not become empty and the oil jug did not run dry according to the word of the Lord he had spoken through Elijah. Isn't God good? Listen, even in the famine, God guides. And even in the famine, God provides. And when your provisions run dry, God as your source never does. He never does. I heard a story about a woman who Every morning, she would wake up and she would walk out into her front yard. She would stand by her front gate with her hands in the sky and she would yell, praise the Lord, to begin her day. Every day, praise the Lord. Well, each time she did that, she had an atheist neighbor who would hear her saying this and she would walk out and as a response to her proclamation, praise the Lord, she would respond and say, there is no Lord. She did this day after day after day. One day, though, her, her prayer did change because she was a poor woman and she had nothing to eat. And because she was hungry, she went out there to have her quiet time and she said, Lord, I'm hungry. Please send me some food. And the next morning, much to her surprise, she walked outside and, and discovered a big bag of groceries right there on her front porch. With tears streaming down her face, she put her hands in the sky and she said, praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. And about that time, the neighbor jumped out of the bushes. <laughs> jumped out of the bushes and said, listen, I told you so. There is no Lord. I'm the one who bought those groceries. I'm the one who put the groceries there. To which the lady responded and said, praise the Lord. God not only provided me with groceries, he made the devil pay for them. Amen. I think about <laughs> Listen, our God is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. And his provisions may come 
in a different way than you're expecting. But you better believe our God is faithful to provide. You know, the first time we see that name for God, Jehovah Jireh, in Genesis chapter 22. That's the story of Abraham and Isaac as they were climbing the side of Mount Moriah. And you know the story. You can probably imagine the scene in your mind. You got a father and a son walking together. You got the son carrying firewood. You've got the dad carrying a knife. And they were making this journey because the Lord told Abraham to offer his son Isaac to God as a sacrifice. That would be an unimaginable request for any father. I can't even imagine what that must have been like. And yet Abraham obeyed the Lord. You can just imagine the scene as they're climbing the mountain and Isaac stopping to ask his dad, Dad, where's the lamb for the sacrifice? I know what we're doing. Where's the lamb? And you can imagine Abraham responding to his son with a lump in his throat, locking eyes with his boy and saying with complete confidence, son, our God will provide a lamb. He is provider God. He is Jehovah Jireh. In that moment, God observed the unquestioning obedience of Abraham as he offered his son to the Lord as a sacrifice. But in that very last moment, just prior to slaying his son, our God, Jehovah Jireh, rescinded that command and he provided a ram in the thicket to be a sacrifice as a substitute for Isaac. See, he's the God who said in Isaiah 43, 19, indeed, I make a way in the wilderness. I'm a God who puts rivers in the desert. He's a God who makes a way where there seems to be no way. And perhaps you've experienced his providing hand before. You know, I believe we could go around this room today and hear story after story of God's faithfulness in providing for us. But because we don't have time to hear all of them, I do want to share one of them with you today. It's a lady in our church named Tammy. And I was blessed to hear her story and I wanted to share it with you today. Check this out. Hi, I'm Tammy Murray and I have a story to tell. I was att attending another church, but I got an email inviting me to uh, a single small event here. I came in, I heard the testimony of the speaker that night. Uh, it was a story of a lot of uh, broken relationship after a broken relationship. And, um, and she told of how she come to a point where she was so broken that God come to her and asked her to spend a year alone with him. That night, she asked all the single moms um, to, to take the challenge of spending one year alone with Jesus and allow him to be their healer and allow him to be their husband, allow him to be their provider. And as hard as that was, I uh, had a fear of being alone. And he just, he kept speaking to me, come on, let me, let me heal you. Let me heal your wounds. Uh, let me treat you like a princess. Let me be your provider. And um, I ended up, I took the challenge. And the first year um, alone with Jesus was one of the hardest of my life. It felt like a detox, detoxing from all the broken relationships, all the, all the trauma, all the hurt that I had caused people and that had been um, done to me. And I felt like at times he was pulling me through that first year, um, dragging me through. And we got to the end and here I was looking at what's next. And at the end of that year, he said, I had to drag you through the first. Will you go with me willingly through the second? And I said, yes. And it became this journey of each year. Uh, at the end of the year, he would say, will you go with me another? Will you go with me another? And each year he was teaching me something different about myself and about him. So the Lord brought me here in 2020, January 2020, and um, March 2020 happened. It was kind of hard for me to understand. Here I am starting out in, in a new church, new groups. Um, I, I wasn't sure, you know, how things were going to work out. But as soon as I came, I, I instantly got plugged in with the, the singles group um, Bible study and also um, found a group called Hands and Feet where we go out and serve in the community. He just kept telling me just to be be obedient, just to keep trusting me. Things were getting tight. Um, they were sending out the stimulus checks and I just remember getting one and just kind of going back and forth like God was saying, you know, okay, are you going to, are you going to tie that? And 
I was like, oh, should I tie this? And um, I remember just having this kind of conversation over a couple of weeks and just thinking, I, I need to hang on to this because I don't know what the, the rest of this year is going to look like. Whenever I decided to, to tie my stimulus check, um, it was unbelievable what happened after that. The next week, I was... Um, I was blessed by by a message that said, "Hey, um, I have something to to give to you. I feel the Lord's telling me to give you something." And um, so I meet a lady from um, from one of my groups in in a parking lot, and she hands me a, a card with uh, money in it. It was it was double of what I had tithed, and followed up with getting another phone call uh, from another lady in, in one of my groups um, asking me for me to give her my address because she had something to drop off to me. And I remember she pulled up in the driveway and she, um, I walked out and she handed me an envelope and she said, um, my parents said um, that they didn't have a use for this and did I know anybody that needed it? And she said, the Lord put you on my heart. I opened it and it was her parents' stimulus checks. What I tithed, God multiplied that tenfold. And it just really blew me away um, of how He provided a way above and beyond all that I could have even imagined. I feel like He has shown me that through, through my surrender, through my commitment to Him and through obedience, that that is where the power of His provision shows up. So not knowing what the rest of this year holds, I'm looking forward to greater things with Jesus. Amen. Can I get a little personal with you real quick? Let me ask you a question. What do you need? What do you need right now? I've been talking to people all week long who have great needs in the area of healing. And that's physical and that's relational and that's personal and that's mental and even spiritual needs. And I just, I'm just reminded that everything you need, God can provide. Everything you need that God can, he can provide it. Jesus is the source of what you need without me knowing the details of your life and your story and your current circumstance and where you're at right now. I, I can just tell you with confidence, Jesus is the source that can meet you at your point of need and he can give you what you need.